So, hi guys, thank you for joining us today on what is week four of what was called the Sober Saturday group, but now we've rebranded and we are now called something exciting. We're now called the Sober Sessions. We've all decided it was best to move on from what happened last Saturday. So, we're going to move on. Our special guests today are the amazing Rock Sober. We'll bring them in soon. Uh, and we're going to be talking about mental health today. Um, I wanted to touch on my mental health because uh, when I was drinking, um, I didn't really know what was happening in my life. I was, I was really depressed actually. And I, I went to see the doctors and they put me on antidepressants, which seemed to take the edge off a little bit. Um, but I found myself kind of locking myself away a lot. I was, my wife found me sitting in a toilet with my head in my hand sometimes, just not knowing what to do and like, just constantly in a dark place. Um, my drinking had spiraled out of control. My anxiety levels were really, really high. Um, and I found myself, I couldn't really manage to be able to do most of the simplest tasks. Like, you know, going to work was a nightmare. And, and I ran my own business, so I had to do my best. But I really, really struggled with answering the phone. You know, quite often it ringing, I just couldn't talk to anyone on the phone. Um, my lowest point, I think, was a couple of years ago, and uh, I had an argument indoors and ended up going to Eastbourne, sitting in a pub all day, drinking, uh, decided it'd be a good idea to actually sleep on the beach that night, and uh, bought a bottle of vodka, drank that, got up the next morning, was on the pier, 10 a.m., the bar was open there, started drinking then. This basically went on for four days. I, I made myself homeless. And I, to be honest, I was absolutely wrecked at the end of it. And um, I somehow made my way home, had to see the doctors again. And uh, it took me months after that to get over that. I decided to become sober. Immediately after that, my anxiety levels dropped and I kind of thought it might be an answer to solve my depression and my mental health. But I, I don't personally, I, I, I don't think it does. I've, I've recently I've had to go back on antidepressants um, because I'm self-employed. My anxiety levels started raising again. And my wife said to me, look, Dave, you, you apparently I've got a face of when I'm really down. And I've just told the doctors that I need to go on them temporary to get me over, over this short period, you know. So for me, it's, it's something I really, really need to work on all the time. And I suppose my point is that even though I'm sober now and I've been sober for over a year, I still have the battles with certain parts of my mental health that they might always be there. But I can honestly say that um, being sober has reduced so so much part of my anxiety around my mental health and um the fact i'm sober makes me feel really really proud of myself and i work hard every day at it. um doing things like this really helps me because we're all part of a community here and although it's an ongoing battle i feel like it's manageable and um yeah i'm in a much better place now I feel okay and I feel really good about my sobriety and more positive, you know. Um, that's my bit. I think actually I'm going to hand over to William today because he's the science man of our panel and it's really good to hear what he has to say about mental health and anxiety. William? Thanks, Dave. So um, the, the link between um, mental health and drinking is, or mental health problems and drinking is fairly well known. Um, and I think to understand it, you pro it's probably worth going back to, you know, the basic physiology that your brain tries to maintain this delicate internal chemical balance. Um, and obviously alcohol is quite a powerful depressant. So when you take it, your brain tries to counteract it by increasing stimulants inside you. And of course, when the alcohol wears off, you're, felt, you're left feeling overly anxious. And of course, the more you're drinking, the more stimulants are left over. And that goes from anxiety into sort of full-blown depression. Um, mental health problems, there's huge amounts um, from a scientific point of view that, that we just don't understand about them. 
Um, and it's always very, very difficult trying to drill down and deal with them. A lot of the time when people go to the doctor with a mental health problem, they are asked if they drink. And if they say, yes, I do drink, and they're drinking a fairly large amount on a regular basis, they're often told to go away and stop drinking before the doctor will do anything. And it can be extremely frustrating because as far as the individual's concerned, the reason they're drinking is because of those underlying health issues. And it's very much chicken and egg. They can't get to grips with the alcohol until they get to grips with that underlying problem. But from the medical profession's perspective, it's virtually impossible for them to drill down and find out what the problem is. Because if you have got a mental health issue, you're constantly going between, you know, um, anaesthetizing your way through it to being overly sensitized and overly depressed and anxious because of the chemical withdrawal. So it becomes very, very difficult for anyone to drill down and find out what the actual problem is. So I think for most people, two points to bear in mind. Firstly, if you do have a genuine mental health problem, you have to quit drinking to be able to really drill down and find out what that problem is. The other point to bear in mind, because alcohol interferes with our sleep and causes anxiety, actually a lot of people that suffer from depression and anxiety and insomnia find it either becomes much more manageable or actually disappears entirely when they quit drinking. Because the drinking causes the anxiety, but it also interrupts as, as you're going up and down on this sort of constant chemical roller coaster. It makes getting decent sleep virtually impossible. And that obviously over the time that has an absolutely huge impact on your mental health. Um, so um, I'll probably hand over now to Simon. Thanks, William. Awesome explanation, as, as always. I never used to see it in those ways. I just had dark clouds hanging over me for 20 or so years with, with regards to my own mental health. And so something I told the doctor how much I drank. I lied every single time I went. And I think a lot of people do that. And I, I actually, a doctor once told me that they always double how much patients tell them they drink to kind of get to a, a true figure. But yeah, I suffered from mental health issues probably for, 15 20 years maybe more than that my anxiety really skyrocketed for the last decade where i was drinking to the point where i couldn't even give a short presentation in front of like 10 or 15 people in my workplace i had to get someone else to read out the talk for me and it, it was a really really tough time and it did just feel like i had dark clouds hanging over me i thought i'd like become destined to become a grumpy old man and it was all just drinking but I, I never saw it at the time and thankfully for me it, I didn't get to a place where I was depressed but I think I was definitely on that path and I'd find myself in low moods very often you know I knew my sleep wasn't good my my face I had darkness under my eyes and it was it was just getting worse and worse and I was drinking more and more I was up to like two or three bottles of wine every day um and I actually did go to doctors. I went to a hypnotherapist about anxiety. I went to counsellors. None of them fixed it. And it was quitting drinking in the end when I finally felt that the internal conflict had got so much that I needed to make a change. That was what helped me out of that place that I'd found myself in. And it was probably, I'd say, three or four months after I quit where those dark clouds of anxiety it was almost like they started to blow away and I actually felt the sun on my face for the first time in like 20 years and I was started smiling and laughing naturally again I've never looked back it, you know my anxiety is now what I would call sort of like if, like normal like how it how it's meant to be which is amazing and then just the last little thing is i also discovered since I quit that I've got adult ADHD and I would never have discovered that again it's another mental health thing I would never have discovered that unless I'd quit drinking because I was covering up the symptoms by turning to alcohol so it's been quite an interesting and wonderful journey of self-growth and finding things out about myself all from putting the bottle down which is awesome so who wants to go next uh should we go to what about Lisa? Are you going to share your story? I can't, yeah, I will do. I can't even imagine you ever being a grumpy old man, Simon. But you see, you didn't know, you didn't know the drink in me, you see. 
I just <laughs> cannot imagine it at all. And it's been kind of nice to share bits of your journey. And when you speak about like finding out about ADHD, when you wrote and spoke about that, I related so much to that. I was like, I spoke to Alex, didn't I? I was like, yeah. oh my God, I think that I have this. So I started I spoke like, to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> what about me? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose my story is I had social anxiety and I never realized I had social anxiety until after I'd stopped drinking so looking back I kind of used to drink to fit in and this started at a really young age from being like 13 I was always classed as kind of a popular kid really at school so nobody would have ever known how anxious I was in social social situations so even going out at that young age before Thursday club I was the one necking a bottle of white lightning um so people thought it was you know because I was trying to be cool I was just so nervous of going into these situations um when I used to drink and it would always be to excess I was always the last one at the party I was a binge drinker that was my thing but then I'd suffer really bad with anxiety so the day after a night out I would hate myself I would replay everything that I'd said or done the night before and I wasn't really a bad drunk if that's what you want to call it um but I just hated myself so much the day after I used to get palpitations I'd ring Alex and be like oh my god I hate myself and she'd be like you've not done anything you'll be fine but then what I found is that anxiety then rolled into my week so I'd be anxious every single day I remember I wouldn't even be able to answer my phone if I didn't know the number I'd be like oh I can't answer it or my mum would ring me and say can you book a table at this restaurant for all of us and and I wouldn't want to do it I'd feel really anxious about ringing people so drinking kind of is what made me really anxious so when I stopped that just went and it went quite quickly as well so I still kind of get a little bit nervous when I'm going out like this doing this right now oh my god my drinking me won't believe that I were doing this even I can't believe I'm doing this right this second but but it's given me so much confidence um stopping drinking it's helped with everything now something else that I've discovered about myself is that I'm a masker so I kind of um I'm quite matter of fact and some people would think I'm a bit hardcore so when things happen to me that other people would think were quite bad or sad I kind of brush it off and I do this until I crash so for instance I've had a uh, couple of marriage breakdowns um, I remember just before my youngest daughter was born I actually had a miscarriage and my mother-in-law at the time she took like eight weeks off work for my miscarriage and I were back at work in two days I was like what's she doing that for so I'd kind of just kind of get on with it and I'm like it's fine it's fine it's fine and then every few months and Alex will feel it coming because, you know, she's like, who knows everything, don't you? But every few months, things will just get massively on top of me and I crash and I don't want to speak to anybody. Um, so I kind of deal with things like that. Like I've started running again. I do a lot of walking. I read self-help books. I've got affirmations on my bedroom mirror to tell me how beautiful and strong and amazing I am every morning meditation and um, so I spend a lot of time doing things like that to try and help me with my mental health I suppose um, and I'm kind of learning that it's okay to be sad about things a big thing for me is to try and not mask them anymore try and understand my feelings sit with them kind of feel them instead of pushing them away all the time I'm kind of learning that um but stopping drinking for me honestly it's just been the answer I've never felt as good like or as confident and I'm just forever grateful that I found sobriety so if anybody's watching and relates to that anxiety and hates yourself and you're still drinking honestly sobriety has just been heaven for me so I'm going to pass on now to my other half Alex I don't like it that you went first I feel all out of place <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> uh, so yeah I guess 
actually in terms of mental health it makes sense that I go after Lisa because she got sober before me as well and I didn't know my whole life that I had anxiety and I also didn't know how to deal with my anxiety because I just didn't know it was there so I just thought I was super organized a list maker you know I was somebody who counted my steps and thought that that was kind of normal and maybe it is I don't know but I've, I've stopped doing it since I got sober so maybe it isn't um, but it was all about for me controlling everything and it stemmed from my childhood which was chaotic and it was I suffered a lot of trauma um, and that impacted my mental health but similar to Lisa I guess because that was my normal it had I hadn't realized it had impacted on me in any way whatsoever until a couple of years ago when I had a miscarriage and I was still drinking at that point not during the pregnancy but up to that point and I crashed similar to what Lisa's just talking about and it resulted in I just I wanted to disappear that's the only way I can describe it I was I was not suicidal um, I didn't think about committing suicide, but I did think about just disappearing out of my life. I wanted to go. I wanted to just not be there. I didn't want to face the pain that I was dealing with. And I didn't know how to face the pain that I was dealing with because all I'd ever done my whole life when anything bad happened was got pissed. That's what I'd done and laughed it off and had a good time. So when this happened to me, um, and I, I spoke to Lisa and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm falling apart. And I really did feel like I was falling apart. I was a nervous wreck. I couldn't get myself into work. I couldn't speak to people. A lot of bad things happened with my family around the same time. So I had no one to talk to, no one to trust. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. I was in a very bad way. And she just came to my house, which is another thing about stopping drinking, because she wouldn't have been able to do that when she'd been drinking. She wouldn't have dedicated herself to me, but she did. And she, she didn't do the pull yourself together thing, but she just nursed me back to health and it started with me stopping drinking and I think like Dave said it, it has not cured me stopping drinking by no means am I cured but now when I'm faced with a problem I can see it coming I've got the clarity to recognize that my mental health is starting to suffer and I can see it and I and you know last time it happened I went to the doctors and I sat there and I cried in the chair and I said I'm falling apart I can feel it happening and he said do you want me to prescribe some sertraline? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, right, only on the condition that you hold on to the prescription for two weeks, do some meditation, do your running, and just do what you've been doing and don't get the prescription for two weeks. And I made him that promise. I took the prescription and I didn't end up having to take it. And that's not saying that you shouldn't. I, I think if you get to a point where you've exhausted other options, you should take medication actually. But I'd made that promise and I would have never, number one, recognized that I was going under. I would have just got on with it. And the second thing is that had I recognized it, I wouldn't have faced it. I wouldn't have known how to face it. So for me, what sobriety's done for me is given me tools and clarity so that I can face the issues that I've got. They certainly haven't gone away. I'm still anxious. I still talk too quickly. I still fidget. I still have to have such things done in a certain order. I'm still a control freak, but I can see it coming when it's going to spiral out of control. So that's me, over to Mandy. I feel quite um, quite emotional today about talking about this subject. I don't know, just listening to every little bit of people's stories and going, oh yeah, that's, that's part of my story too and that bit too. Um, I think, um, I guess the, the beginning really is that, you know, even as a young child, I kind of, was super super sensitive very like a highly sensitive person kind of never really felt that I fit with my family so I always felt a little bit like the black sheep and kind of like felt unhappy really and I didn't really know why and so from a very young age there was a lot of shame of like why can't I just be normal and why can't I like just be happy and why can't I fit and so I spent um, a lot of years trying to fit and sort of being this chameleon of kind of changing who I was to try and fit with people um, and then you know as Lisa said you know when booze came into the picture around the age of kind of 13 um, that was that kind of elixir to sort of social anxiety and it was like oh okay it doesn't matter now like you know, I can be that person and it gave me that kind of confidence to to be in a social situation um, and 
I, I mean, I think maybe I've kind of, maybe there's neurodiverse stuff going on too. That's something I'm going to explore because certainly at school, like I couldn't concentrate. I was always in trouble. I was always getting kicked out of class. Like I just didn't do well with any sort of authority and I found it really hard to concentrate and I still do now. Um, and things kind of got pretty bad for me um, after I became a mum. Um, I had quite a lot of trauma around the age of 18, 19 that I kind of swallowed and um, didn't address at the time, didn't, you know, swore to everyone that I would never speak about it and I didn't speak about it for 10 years. Um, and then I became a mum and I had a daughter and, you know, I had this person to love that I wanted to protect, that I didn't want anything bad to happen. And I couldn't marry up what had happened to me, my childhood, which had been very happy. My parents are very loving people. Uh, and then all the sort of danger and all the bad things that had happened to me and all the sort of stupid decisions I'd made and the bad boyfriends and the drugs and the alcohol and all that stuff. Um, and I had quite a good job. I was a university professor, so I was working hard, you know, it all big, you know, tick all the boxes. Um, and in the end, I kind of uh, had a nervous breakdown or burnout, as they like to rebrand it these days. Um, and I was doing it quite heavily, really, because connecting who was the young person who was the child. And then as a mum, responsible, I kept between the two. Um, and so I went to therapy. I was going to be like every week at the beginning I kind of realized that I needed to address my drinking problem so I did that stopped drinking after many many attempts stopped drinking for a year um did really well felt amazing quit mob made loads of plans we moved from like inner city to to the seaside it was like this is all brilliant right weaned myself off my antidepressants with my doctor and then after a year and three days was like well I can I can moderate I can drink because I'm good now like I'm not depressed anymore um, and then for the next sort of two and a half years I kind of would drink for three months and then it would get to a point where it was unmanageable and then I quit and then I start drinking again and then I quit and the kind of culmination of us moving sort of ramped up my post-traumatic stress disorder and I wasn't sleeping. I stopped sleeping completely. So I was uh, very, very bad insomniac, uh, which is something I still suffer with. So in the end, I got put on very hardcore sort of antipsychotic medication to get me to sleep. Um, and I was seeing a psychiatrist and a therapist and put back on antidepressant. So I stopped drinking again. Um, and really, you know, I guess the thing is for me, they come hand in hand. Like I, I wouldn't risk not being on antidepressants right now because every time I've come off antidepressants, I've gone back to drinking because I seek something to level me out, you know, to kind of, for whatever reason. So for me at the moment, that kind of, they're my part of my toolkit. They're part of my safety net of my sobriety. Um, in terms of what sober does for me and my mental health, it is that reconnection to self that like I trust myself now, I like myself now, like I don't feel alone anymore, I don't feel like the black sheep, like I've met loads of people that I connect with that are highly sensitive like me. Um, and so it's all that side of that I don't need to drink because I don't need to fit in anymore and I don't need to lose myself in the crowd of party people because I've found my people where I can be totally honest and you know be too honest like I am all the time you know and I was criticized that for that most of my life that like you're too honest you're too sensitive you're too you know too much like and now it's like well okay I can be like that with my sober friends and everyone else can fuck off <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that's um that's me really and it, it it's hugely it's the toolkit that goes around the emotional intelligence the sitting with your feelings the thing of like okay i know this is going to pass like i know i'm going to get through it um i do have some dark days where i feel bad but like they're never the i mean my depressions would go on for months where i'd feel like i was in a 
glass box and my life was going on around me. I'd sit at the dinner table with my kids and my husband and they'd be having a lovely time and I'd just not be there, you know, and that happens maybe twice a year now and it will happen for two days and then I can get myself, I can analyze, okay, you're really tired. You need to take some things off the list. You need to look after yourself, all those things rather than sort of losing myself for two, three months at a time. So that's me. Uh, so I'll pass you, well, I'll pass you back to Dave and then you can introduce our guests. Uh, thanks for that, Mandy. That was really moving. Thank you so much. Uh, just briefly, I won't take up too much time because I want to get the boys in, but when I first gave up drinking, I'd been drinking for over 40 years and I literally had no idea if there was anything without drinking. You know, like my, I used to say to myself, well, what is there if I can't have a drink? And it was probably just a few weeks in that I saw this sober event over in Dalston and I messaged one of the boys and I just said to them, look, what's this all about and whatever. And they were great. They answered me straight back. And when I went to this event, it was really intimidating for me because normally I'd have a few on my own in a pub, sit on my own, have a few live and then go in. But obviously I couldn't do that. As soon as I went in, I met them. They were amazing. They, they gave me a big man hug. And from that, we've been really, really good friends. We've been out together. We've had a curry. We've, you know, we do a lot of social things together. And I, I love these guys. They're just so, so amazing. They're incredibly humble, giving, and just the nicest, nicest guys. And as you can see, I've got most of their merchandise as well. So a little plug there, boys. Anyway, um. I love you guys. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Lisa's been amazing. She's done some amazing things for me as well. everyone's lovely I love, I love you all sober sessions we're amazing so today I'm going to actually bring in Sean first and uh get you Sean to tell me your story please mate no problem at all thanks ever so much Dave and and all for inviting Rock Sober to talk about it is a a topic that we should all talk about more often I think um and I think, you know, the further you go into your journey of sobriety, it's something I was thinking about just recently. I probably have suffered with depression for a really long time. But it's not until you get sober, you can actually put your finger on what was making you miserable because of the clarity. And I think, you know, that kind of uh, resonates. You know, a lot of people have already said that, that have spoken before me. Um, but sort of talking about my journey, really, I mean, I've, Fantastic childhood, um, loving parents. You know, my brother's not too bad. Um, we, we've had a, we had a really really nice upbringing, um, plenty of love. So um, I can't put it down to anything there. But one of my sort of earliest thoughts of I suppose trauma really. Uh, people have talked about trauma, and for me, when I was at um, secondary school, I was bullied all the way through it from the age of eleven up until the age of 13, um, maybe because I was slightly different. And, you know, this is quite laughable, really, but it was actually 1977 I was at secondary school. It was the year that Grease, the, the movie, came out. And me being the rock and roller at that young age, quite clearly, I thought I was Danny Zuko. So out came the Brill Cream. I used to go to school thinking, oh, and all my books were signed, Danny Zuko. I was, I was him. And... You know, fair play. Probably a lot of people didn't really take well to that. But I probably bought a lot of that on myself. But that is just me and that's my personality. And why should I? But I was bullied constantly for two years. So people, you know, kids would wait for me outside the school gates. I would be followed around town. If I was at the swimming pool and they got wind that I was there, they would come in the swimming pool and beat me up in the changing rooms. It was just absolutely awful. I didn't tell my parents because I was embarrassed. I didn't tell my teachers because I thought, you've just got to stand up to this. You've got to, you know, you've just got to face it. I used to get punched and clobbered. And I think I was, I was afraid of what my parents would think of me if I retaliated. If I actually punched them back, would I get into trouble myself? So I kind of took that on the chin. But one thing that did for me is it drove me to work extra hard to get to grammar school because I thought, if I could get to a school like a grammar school, I would be amongst different people that would have a different outlook on life and it would be a better breed of people, basically, um, which thankfully I did achieve. So, um, you know, I worked my socks off. I got myself to grammar school and at 
from 13 onwards, I had a phenomenal, you know, last two or three years of education. I didn't work particularly hard. I didn't get particularly great results from my exams, but I think I had the gift of the gab. And um, I landed myself a job of all jobs. And then sat down with my dad at, at the age of 15, 16 and asking for advice on what career I should go into. And um, really at the time, you know, mums and dads and, you know, school teachers were basically saying banking, insurance, you know, going to a grammar school, the grammar school were pushing me academically and I wasn't really academic. It wasn't what I wanted to do. I actually shone at art. I was quite good at art, you know, in, in art lessons. Um, but the, again, the grammar school just did not want me to go in that direction. They wanted to push me into an academic direction. So I had a, a, a job interview with Natural Stockbrokers at the age of, uh, I think I was 15 when I had the interview. And just before my 16th birthday, I'd got a job with the stockbrokers and I took it. Didn't know what I was letting myself in for. My first day there, I mean, talk about welcome to the world of drinking. Um, as a 16 year old boy, my boss took me out for a four hour binge down at the NatWest Stockbrokers um, bar, which was all subsidized. So it was about, 30, at the time, it was 30p for a double whiskey. I mean, hello, that was serious. And I remember leaving uh, the bar actually on that, that lunchtime. We got back about four o'clock and there were a number of dustbins on the way back. It was only a short walk to the office and I was sick in every dustbin. I just clearly was quite a novice at drinking at that stage. Um, but I thought it was great. I thought, here we go. I was doing that every day. And Lee will contest to that because he works in the city and we did work together for a number of years. Um, but that, <clears throat> that, I suppose, was the fun times. If I kind of just propel it forward a bit, because obviously in that career, I didn't know really where, where I was. I didn't know whether I would stay in this career. But one thing leads to another. You know, I got myself married. I had a couple of children. And all of a sudden, my career was, was my rock. I, you know, I had kids. I had a mortgage. I had, to, I had to hold on to all of that. And I started to feel pressure because it, I was in an environment that I never felt comfortable in and in a job that I really didn't want to do. And, and I think for the older ones in this audience that will remember, um, do you remember Mr. Um, Mr. Ben? Do you, so Dave, you I'm probably, probably only a couple of us, mate. <laughs> so it might only be a couple of us. But both We're people. too young. I love Mr. <laughs> ben, but yeah. Mr. Ben was a character I watched when I was at primary school. And he used to be a fella that wore a bowler hat and a suit and he'd go into this tent and every single day he would be a different character. He would put on a safari outfit and then he'd be in the jungle. Every morning when I got ready for work and I had to put on my pinstripe suit and my paisley tie, I felt like Mr. Ben. It was not me. And that was for 30 plus years. I was cocooned in a world that I didn't belong in. I was, you know, my... I suppose my creative side was frustrated. I was, you know, having to get emotions to, to better myself and better my family. And I've got to a, a very senior level. I left, I did 13 years in banking and then I switched to actually selling software to stockbrokers and fund managers. So I worked for companies like Bloomberg and Reuters and I was made redundant seven times because of the, how cutthroat that industry is hitting a million pound a year target and then potentially the next quarter you might be off target off you're not performing you're out so that happened to me seven times um and i think my depression and anxiety was at levels that i just couldn't deal with and whilst i was partying all the time my software sales role in the city entailed taking fund managers out to, to dinner and wine bars and all the rest of it, lunchtime, evening meals, you name it. And there was always you know, a bottle or two of champagne on the go. Um, I was used to that. But what happened to me was I started to drink at home. And I know, Dave, you resonate with that massively. And then, you, yeah. you, know, you know, I was doing seven pints of Guinness maybe in a lunchtime and then maybe a, a bottle of wine with a client in the, in the evening. And then on my way home, get off the train, go to the wine, the wine store and grab three bottles of red wine. Um, and what I would do is I would take two indoors and hide one round the side under a dust, knowing that I would get through two, but the other half wouldn't worry about two because that was quite normal. 
But then when she went to bed, I'd go and grab the other one and down the other one. She's going to bed at sort of one, two o'clock in the morning, getting up at half five, six to do another day. How I functioned, I do not know. Um, but it was for me a coping mechanism. Without the alcohol, I would not have coped with that industry. It was the only thing, in my opinion, that got me through. And in retrospect, when I look back now, I wish I'd have taken the, um, the move to become sober a lot sooner. Because when you're sober, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's easy with 2020 vision, but life is so much better now. Um, I was on medication for about 20, 25 years on a strong dose of paroxetine. Uh, I'd actually had two nervous breakdowns. When I worked for Reuters, I saw um, a consultant, like a psychiatrist. They asked me to see a psychiatrist because they knew I was drinking. I was sporadic. I was falling asleep at my desk. I was just not productive. And um, so after I saw my psychiatrist at Reuters, um, I was prescribed quite a strong dose of uh, medication. And I was just out of my face. I just wasn't me. My per I didn't care about anything. And to be honest with you, that fueled my drinking even more because I just wasn't, I wasn't bothered about life. I didn't care because I was so miserable. I just did not care what happened to me. I was probably on my own mission to slowly kill myself because of how miserable I was. And there was a point in time when um, I worked for Reuters and uh, I had to do this kind of uh, stand up in an auditorium the global thing that was being aired all over the world and I was talking about this new product which A, I had no interest in whatsoever, B, I didn't, understand, didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Um, I just can't wait to get off the podium. Um, and um, it was after that that I actually stood at Canary Wharf on the Docklands and thought I'm just going to throw myself in the Thames because I don't want to look, this is not what I want. I'm not happy in anything, any aspect of my life. Um, let me tell you a little bit about kind of what happened after that. But our drinking, my brother and I, our drinking was getting to levels that were just seriously dangerous. We were getting away. We were, we were kind of troublesome and we were a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, happy as Larry one minute, one drink too many. We were, you know, like the Cray twins, uh, an absolute nightmare. Uh, we had a number of scrapes which we got away with, but, but you know, sadly in... 2014 I think it was we uh, got into a scuffle in a, in a pub and one thing led to another um, it was it was ugly you know we were headlines in the local newspapers for all to see our family especially which devastated Lee and I um, we were just in the limelight it was out of character but it was the drink you know it, it was ruining our lives everything was crumbling beneath it. and this particular scenario you know, we were being told that we could potentially go down, be sent down to prison for what we've done. Um, and that loomed over us for two years because it went to CPS and they were dragging their heels. But at that point, that was in 2014. Um, at that point, I know Lee got sober before me, but in January of um, 2015, on the 1st of January, I was partying here with my girlfriend, uh, New Year's Eve, you know, bottle of whiskey, uh, loads of Guinness, a little bit of wine, and I was drinking from eight in the morning. I think it was about nine o'clock at night, I just killed over. And um, obviously my other half called the ambulance. And my mental state was, was awful. And this is post the fight in the pub. Um, I was drinking more because it was obviously, it was really making me feel quite down and quite anxious. Um, and the ambulance guys came along and I actually thought they was going to section me. That's the sort of mentality. That's what was going on in my head. They've only come to section me. They're not coming to help. They're just going to, they're going to torture me even more. So I lashed out at the ambulance man. And then before I knew it, a meat wagon turned up, police van. I was literally thrown in the back of the police van. So I saw my new year's day in 2015 in, in a, in a cell. And at that particular police station um, it was horrific it was ugly it wasn't the first time I've been in a cell but it was probably a bit of a wake-up call and I remember the superintendent saying to me on my way out that aren't you a bit old for this you need to you need to sort yourself out mate you, you know you're an intelligent bloke you've got everything going for you you know you what you're doing you need to sort your life out 
And that stayed with me. And the minute I walked out of that police station, I said, I swear down, I will never have a drink again. My girlfriend had threatened that she couldn't have me back because of the way I was behaving. She had young children. Um, so I had a massive wake up call. And for me, the 1st of January 2015 is where everything in my life changed. It wasn't easy, went stone cold sober, didn't have any AA, didn't get any help. Um, I just sort of locked myself away for a little bit, tried to inspire things that I knew would be an escape from the real world. Um, I started mountain biking. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I just did lots of things that I probably should have been doing for all those years, but I was more interested in drink. I didn't actually give myself any time. I didn't love myself. So I started to love myself. And it was beautiful. And um, I do get quite emotional, so bear with me. But what, what happened for me, and I think the big turning point in my life was at that point, I knew I had to walk away from my career. I had to. If I'm going to give up drinking and change my life, and for one, for just, you know, from now on, be happy, wake up happy. Not wait, I was rocking in bed. I was rocking in my chair. I was a mess. I didn't want that. It was purely down to the fact that I had... I had I'd probably aimed too high. I was climbing the ladder because I had to, because, you know, one thing lead, leads to another when you're married and all that stuff. Um, but it was time to be selfish and it was time to do what I wanted to do. So I threw the towel in on software sales. I threw the towel in on banking. I actually had my hands tattooed so that I would never be tempted to go back to that shit industry ever again. And thank God, because no one would have employed me with tattooed hands. Um, I learned to become a barista. I bought myself a coffee truck with a mate. We went out and sold coffee at festivals. I was earning a crust, nowhere near what I was earning in the city, but you know, a million times happier. And that for me, that, that for me is the only way I could have done this. I left the career. I've been now sober five years. Obviously rock sober for me is a massive rock, but you know, I still have to work alongside rock sober, but I choose to do work that, isn't gonna stress me out. So there's not office work anymore. It's manual work that I get stuck in on. Yep, you know, it's, uh, it's physically tiring and knackering, but as long as I look after this, I'm never gonna have a drink. I don't mind coming home with aching muscles, aching arms and legs. I can deal with that. But when this is played on too much, that's the end of the game for me, I'll be back on it. So that was a big turning point for me. I've been sober five years. I did come off the medication two years into my sober journey, because I started to feel clarity, started to feel better. And I've been three years without it. And not saying that I don't struggle. I've had seriously bad anxiety attacks recently. Um, but depression wise, I've got everything to live for now. I love myself. I love who I've become. I love the fact that Rock Sober can help other people on their journey. It gives me something to live for. And, it, and kind of Lee will admit this, that because Lee and I have rock sober, we can't ever go back to drink. That's kind of like the, that's the golden handcuffs. We don't want to let our following down. You know, we've got to stay sober to encourage them to stay sober. So we've got a responsibility, but it is a nice responsibility. So that's my story, guys. Hope that's, hope Thank that's okay. Oh, that was amazing. That, that made me really emotional. And I'm really with you, by the way, on the when you're together and you've got something like that, there's no going back. Me and Alex were like, that's us now. We can't be sure, Ben, you'll be the same. Kate's not, <laughs> not here today, but that's definitely, yeah, let's make ourselves accountable. Um, yeah, that's really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, in terms of the drinking side of it, it's kind of, you know, well, fairly similar to, to bros, really. Um, in terms of the mental health side, uh, obviously, we both struggled. I can really first remember my kind of issue with mental health, probably in my early teens. Um, but it really sort of come to the fore when I was around about 15. Um, and I, too, was at grammar school. There was stress with the exams. Um, my nan or aunt nan had passed away sadly and that was, that was a shock to say the least um, but what, what my, my problem was I, I used to wash my hands continuously um, I used to find myself waking up during the night 
uh, and continuously washing my hands would feel, you know, I used to feel that they were contaminated with, with germs uh, and I would catch a disease. And in the, in the sort of mid to late 80s at, at that time, AIDS was actually prevalent and it was, you know, there was a stigma with AIDS and, and, and this, that and the other. So I was kind of scared, if you like, that I might contract AIDS. So my obsession or my compulsion was to continuously wash my hands. So, you know, I got to the stage where, you know, I couldn't touch taps, I couldn't touch door handles, you know, I used to do things with light switches, this, that and the other. And it got to the stage even where at the grammar school, uh, my mate used to come and not for me to go to school and he actually used to do my shoelaces up because I couldn't touch my shoes for fear of contamination and, and you know, germing up my hands, basically. So that was ridiculously tiring and that time, you know, quite debilitating. So I went to see um, a psychiatrist about that. I was diagnosed as having OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and was given medication. So I've been on the medication ever since. The medication has kind of gone from one to the other, but it's mainly fluoxetine or Prozac, which I've been on um, for, you know, on and off for about 30 years, or over 30 years. Um, at that young age as well, because I was struggling with the OCD and the mental side of it and all the obsessional and the irrational thoughts, when I used to go out of my mates at school, um, obviously underage, but I used to go into a pub that was renowned for letting people in that could drink who were only sort of 15, 16, so naturally we all went there, I would tend to drink probably quite a lot more than other people, purely as a release mechanism to kind of release my, my stress of, of the OCD. So that's always been kind of the compounding factor, really, I think, for my drinking, certainly. And it kind of got worse and then it's got better as my sort of life has gone on. I still suffer from it now. Nowhere near as bad. It's not as debilitating, but I still do suffer from it. Um, so really going on from sort of 15 to 17 or 18, I started work again, like Bro in the City. I actually started my first job with Sean working opposite him in the same bank, uh, which was crazy. I mean, you're going to be allowed to do that these days because of security and fraud and all of that sort of stuff. But you can imagine us two together at lunchtime. You know, it was, a, again, every, I wouldn't say every lunch, but most lunches we would be out, particularly on a Friday, it would be a four-hour. You know, you, you get back to the office. You'd be drunk getting back to the office. You'd be sick in the office. You'd have to go home because you were so drunk. Um, so that's, that kind of, for me, was how the, the drinking sort of started. Um, I mean, I, I sort of progressed through my career. I tried to progress through my career. Um, I was working for Credit Suisse at one stage in my sort of mid-20s. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, don't know really what caused it. It could have been I had a car accident the previous Christmas. It could have been that, the shock that brought it on. It could potentially be in the stress of the OCD and the depression and the anxiety. Got no idea. So I had to deal with that. And then also when I was 23, I was um, I went to the Priory Hospital for about four weeks for OCD and depression. I wasn't particularly in a, in a, in a great way. Um, I left the Priory after about four weeks, had the CBT, the normal stuff. Uh, I was still on my medication. In fact, my medication was changed inside, but absolutely killed me. Absolutely knocked me out. Not, I can't remember what it was, but it was some strong shit that they gave me. Um, and I had sort of major withdrawals trying to get off of that and get onto something else that I could actually cope with. So um, when I came out of the Priory, um, I think I was with Credit Suisse for a year or so off sick. They eventually sort of laid me off because I was useless to them, in effect. So they paid me some money to leave. I then decided with my first wife to start a brand new shiny life in Spain. So um, my first wife and I lived with her parents to try and save as much money as we could. We bought, out, uh, bought a house in Spain, which we were having a mortgage on out there. I would work out there and this, that and the other. So we moved out there. It was great. Um, ended up getting a job uh, and then actually started my own business in real estate. 
which was challenging as well with the OCD again. And, you know, the drinking aspect of it as well was ridiculous. Cheap drink out there. You know, it was sunny. You know, you had a communal pool. So you'd go in there, you'd drink, you'd have parties and this, that and the other. And that really took hold big time because the, the booze was cheap. Um, and it was ruining not only me, but it was ruining our marriage and our relationship. I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, um, saying no more, but I was. Um, and basically the marriage broke up. Um, and that was that was the end of our, our marriage. But not only that, um, we obviously lost the house. We uh, had bought or put a deposit on another property uh, as an investment. I can't remember how much we put down, but it was, I think about 70,000 euros or something. Um, we ended up losing that because we couldn't afford to keep it. So that was a mission. Um, and then I came back to the UK and I, didn't, I, I vowed never ever to come back to the UK. I think I was just trying to escape the UK through all the shit that I've been through. Um, but I had to come back, I had to find work. Uh, it took me a while to find work again, but did eventually. Again, trying to work my way up the, the career ladder. Um, ended up getting a job, um, you know, at Deutsche Bank, a contracting role at Deutsche Bank, really, you know, quite a responsible role. Um, and it was going quite well. And I was actually, for the first time, it wasn't, it was a job that I was actually quite enjoying because I was, I was given a lot of responsibility and it kind of empowered me a little bit. I felt kind of needed, if you like, and it, it was good for me. But the drinking, um, Really, from when I'd come back, um, I, I remarried in, in 2012. Um, but when I came back um, after remarrying, the drinking sort of again increased. Started to drink again like bro at night. That used to increase as well. You know, the Friday nights were particularly bad. Um, Saturdays, Sundays throughout, I would wake up Saturday morning and have a drink. You know, I wake up Sunday morning, have a drink, continue and continue to go to the pub. You know, I was fortunate enough that my employer, Deutsche Bank, let me work from home. So I used to kind of make the most of that sometimes. In the, On a Sunday night in particular, when I was due into work on the Monday, I would phone the boss up or text him at about half ten um, and tell him, you know, I've got something on. I'll, I'll have to sort of, you know, work from home. That was my excuse to... To basically get on it and, and have, have a good session. I could get up that little bit later um, and sort of work from home. So, you know, it kind of escalated. And like what Sean, Sean was saying, in, you know, in the, in the June of 2014, it kind of all come to an abrupt end. It was very, very quick, um, you know, from, from a scene of the night before Sean and I were together in, in, in my house. Uh, we didn't sleep all night. We were drinking all night. We carried on in the morning. We went to Weatherspoons for about nine o'clock, like you do. Um, we were both drinking, obviously. Um, I was on my double vodka. Sean was on his Guinness, probably, and whiskey. And we went to a couple of other pubs. We got thrown out of one of them. Uh, and I sort of went out in a bit of a rant. And then um, decided to go to another pub where I'd previously had a little bit of a run-in with, with the landlord. So we went there um, and I was being a dick, basically. I was throwing coins over the bar and just being, a, just being a, an idiot. Um, and he come around the bar, the landlord, and lumped me on the side of the face. Um, so I retaliated and ran after him in the pub and there was fisty cuffs and the chairs flying and it was, it was like the OK Corral, but it wasn't pleasant. It was mid-afternoon. Um, you know, I put my hand through a window, cut all my hand open. You know, naturally the police were called, the ambulance were called. And, you know, we were taken into a cell and questioned and taken into a cell. Now, for me, when I woke up the next morning, I, I was just devastated. And, you know, from what we'd done, it was out of character. Yes, like Sean said, we'd been in a few scrapes, but we kind of sort of, laughed our way out of it a little bit and we were kind of a bit lucky I guess so these things could have happened you know a lot sooner um, but it was this particular day that really landed us kind of in the ship basically so you know like Sean said we, we had to go through a two-year court case before 
you know, our pleas were kind of agreed and, you know, before we were sentenced. Um, there was the chance of us going sort of to be sent down, which kind of devastated both of us. We were like sort of headline news in a local newspaper, this, that and the other. And it was dreadful. It was absolutely dreadful. Now, from June on to October 14, from when I stopped drinking, the drink got even worse because I was so ashamed of what I'd done and what we'd done as, as a family um, that I couldn't cope with it. I, you know, I actually saw my drinking as a, as a slow suicide. You know, I had attempted my life once before on ODing on, on pills with, um, with vodka. Um, but... I think really more than anything, that was a, like a serious cry for help, um, which I did try and get, but it kind of never worked. Um, so, you know, up until June to October, the, the drinking was bad. My mental state was at its worst it's ever been. Um, and my physical health, I mean, I was, I was risking kind of my life as well, really with the diabetes because I'm celiac as well. I have celiac disease, so I could only drink uh, wine or spirits because beer obviously has got barley in it so that would have a, a reaction to me so but there were times when I was out and drunk that I would drink Guinness and stuff that had gluten in it which is obviously not good for me um, so I was kind of in self-destruct mode to, to say the least and I kind of really wanted drink to kill me that that's it I did I wanted drink to kill me um, so I was in a bad way so one evening on in October, um, October the 13th, I had been drinking. Uh, I was at home. I wasn't working because my contract had ended at Deutsche Bank because of the pending court case. So I had no job. Um, I'd lost that. Um, I was drinking during the day and in the evening, I'd had a, an argument with my wife um, again. And I went out into town to just drink, basically. And I walked probably a good half a mile and then I literally come to a standstill and fell on my knees in tears just in bits I was done I was completely shot to pieces uh, physically mentally you know emotionally I was all over the place and I kind of from then on I thought I'm not going to drink anymore this, this is going to be it now because I'd had the argument with my wife my parents picked me up but funny enough on the way home I actually said to my parents, look, you're going to need to take some wine home because I might need some wine when I get in, just as that, that comfort blanket. So I think I had one or two glasses of wine back at my parents' house. And the next morning when I woke up, felt like shit, to be honest. Um, but I knew that I had to stop. I knew that I had to stop. And from that day onwards, I have not touched another drop. So I did stop altogether they did advise me against doing that because of health reasons of having fits and this that and the other but i did stop um i went to some counseling sessions with a, an organization called cri which wasn't the most enticing of um organizations by the name because it was called uh, cri which was crime reduction initiative so you kind of went there thinking you were some sort of like first class criminal which i know we were criminals because we were going to get sentenced and this that and the other so um it took a couple of years for the court case to come around we got sentenced we got a two-year suspended sentence we got uh what else did we get we got tagged for three months we got um community service a ridiculous amount of hours for community service but you know we knew we'd done wrong so we had to do it um, so we, you know, we kind of had the book thrown at us and rightly so, but we, we wasn't sent down, which was, which was kind of a good thing, obviously. Um, so from October sort of 14 to January sort of 2015, when Sean got sober, I was a complete recluse. I didn't do anything. Hardly went out. I didn't want to go out into town. I didn't want any triggers. I become a complete recluse, got just in my shell, and that, that was how I dealt with it. So it took me a while to get out of that, but in sort of 2015, early 2015, I wanted to do something. I'd try to pull myself out of this hole, and I decided to take up photography, which is something that I'd always had a quite a, you know, a keen interest in. 
So did up, uh, sort of took up photography again, pr primarily street photography, which was something fairly new for me. But I wanted to examine the human condition and, and people, and you know, get to see people and their their reactions. In you know, just to stop a moment in time by with photography. So I did that, and I self published a couple of books after that, which obviously kept me sort of going and distracted me from you know sort of drinking and this that and the other. Obviously, my OCD with that played up quite a bit so it was quite tough to get through that but you know I managed it and then in 2017 uh, you know three years into my sobriety I, I kind of fulfilled a dream of going to Nepal um, and visiting Nepal so I've always had kind of an interest in Buddhism not so much as a religion but more as a, as a philosophy and a way of thinking so I went out to Nepal for a month I think it was in April 2017, and decided to volunteer out there to teach English to young Buddhist monks uh, in a monastery, which for me, you know, having interest in Buddhism, but being propelled into a monastery with, you know, the chanting, the music, the, you know, it was the most incredible thing that I had ever, ever done in my life. And... So much so that three months later I had to go back um, because I missed it. I missed the atmosphere. I missed, I missed the, the spiritualism of it all. It was just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to go back soon-ish. Obviously not at the moment, so it's going to have to wait. Um, and then in um, December 2017, uh, the same year as I've been to Nepal, Sean and I had had a discussion about a dream that Sean had had about Rock Sober. He'd had this vision of rock sober in his dream and I wasn't quite right to do it or start it when he mentioned it to me. But in December 2017, I thought, right, this is the time to do it. We need to do this. We can offer inspiration to people. We can try and help people if we can. You know, we always said from the start, if we can offer to help just to one person and it helps someone, then we've done the job that we, you know, that we've set out to do. And we think we're doing that. And, you know, some of the reactions that we get from people who, who we've helped, you know, is phenomenal. We, you know, we're so proud of what we've achieved. Um, and it's all about sort of offering inspiration to other people and putting, you know, <clears throat> it's so important. I think when we first gave up drinking, for Sean and I, there was no inspiration out there. You know, you had your sober celebrities and this, that and the other. But um, we wanted to do something a little bit different, a little bit sort of badass, a little bit rock and roll, um, you know, and to prove to people that you could still rock sober, hence rock sober. So, you know, from then on, it's it's gone from strength to strength. We have obviously released the beer and this, that and the other. And we, you know, we, we were speaking to someone just a couple of days ago about our future plans. Things have obviously sort of come to a slight halt at the moment in terms of progression for obvious reasons. But we've got so many things that we want to do, um, you know, and we intend to carry on. And, you know, it's guys like you running things like this as well that propels the message about mental health because we are very open and honest about it, you know, and it's very difficult for a lot of people to open up. And, you know, I think the more people that do, a problem shared is a problem halved. Not everyone wants to talk about it publicly, which is fine, but if they do have a problem, you know, personally, I would recommend speaking to someone, whether it's your wife, your girlfriend, you know, whether it's your, you know, your husband or, you know, or, or the doctor, you know, who's someone who's actually qualified. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of really my story and, and where we are as Rock Sober. You know, it's been an absolute privilege to be on here and Dave, you're a ledge. And, you know, it's, it's been an absolute honour to meet you and, you know, and everyone else obviously on the group. And, um, and thank you for repping our gear today, dude. <laughs> yeah, oh, mate, that is so, so moving, both of you. And if there's any two examples for what sobriety can offer us, you guys, you know, it's a fantastic story. Uh, is there anyone on the panel that want to say something? I know we've run over slightly, but I think we can go well, over got, still. We've got a couple of questions. Um... Yeah, we've got a couple of questions from the Facebook group. So loads of thumbs up and thank you. And that's really inspiring. And um, so I have a question here that says, um, 
how do you deal with feelings of low self-worth knowing these are caused through drinking as you try to quit alcohol has played havoc in terms of lacking confidence weight gain loss of fitness and looking rough and unhealthy these feelings often cause me to reach for a drink again as i feel low about what i've done to myself i don't know someone I, I don't mind answering that. I mean, um, self-esteem and confidence, obviously alcohol does tend to give us a heightened degree of confidence. And, um, you know, and I, I think for me personally, um, I think what you need to look at is, you know, when I was partying um, and when I was drinking, I, I was a completely different person. Um, I think it's, as I said before, it is only really when you've been sober or when you've abstained from drink for a little while, that you actually start to appreciate and realize that drink isn't the solution. Um, you know, if you're looking at maybe, I mean, fitness isn't particularly my thing, but I think what you need to do is to sort of grasp onto something that really does make you tick. As Lee said, that you know, photography. So if it is fitness that you're into, you know, get yourself into fitness. Cycling was something that I did, but my dream was motorcycling for me. Um, I stopped riding a motorcycle when my children were born, um, but you know, for the reason that, you know, I was a little bit of a nutter um, and I didn't think that uh, my sons would have a father if I carried on riding like I did. So I didn't ride for 15 years, but when I went sober, my promise to myself was that the money that I'm saving from drink, um, I'm going to invest in a motorbike. And whenever I feel low, my self-esteem is low, whenever I'm stressed, I'm not going down the pub, I'm going to get on my motorbike and I'm just going to ride because that makes me feel good. So whatever it is that you like, you know, channel your addictive nature positives. And I hope hopefully that answers that question. That's a good one. I've got one from yeah. Matter as well off Facebook from earlier, if I can ask that to Lee. Um, this yeah. lady says... You spoke about OCD and she suffers badly. It's the germs, hand washing, cleaning, etc. My condition has got much worse since becoming sober. I'm waiting for therapy, but unfortunately that's on hold at the moment due to lockdown. Any advice, please? Oh, well, that's, um, that's, that's a toughie because I know how difficult and understand how difficult it is. Um, for me, when I gave up drinking, it, it did improve. Uh, from a, from a personal point of view, um, if it's got worse, then I'm not sure whether you're on medication or not. Um, obviously, you're waiting for an appointment to see someone, which is great. In the meantime, I mean, I don't know whether you've had therapy, but one one of the things with OCD is, and I don't know the name of the person that, that asked the question, but thank you for asking it, um, is that. For me at the moment, I, my kind of thing with OCD is order. So it's things like paperwork, stupid things like that. So to give you an example, if I was to put a bit of paperwork away in a file, it would have to be in date order, which is fine, and a lot of people would put things in date order. But for me, when I put that folder away, my head and something is telling me inside my head that it's not in the right date. The date is all up, it's all mixed up and I need to correct it. So I'll go back and I'll check it and I'll put the folder back. I'll go back into the lounge and then all of a sudden I'll get another thought. You've got to check it. It's not right. You know, all of your paperwork is all out of order. You're out of control, this, that and the other. So I go back and check it. And that can happen on numerous occasions, which becomes extremely tiring and causes you a lot of anxiety. Obviously what they say, and I don't, I don't know whether the, the person that asked the question is undergoing any sort of therapy at the moment. This is the hardest thing part, as part of OCD. What they tell you to do, uh, you know, any therapist will tell you to, this is what you have to do, is you have to overcome that compulsion to check. Now, even now, I can't overcome that compulsion at all times. I find it extremely difficult. So I have to go and check. Now, sometimes it's just instinct. Sometimes I just do it without even knowing that I'm doing it. So it's kind of a lot of its instinct. But what a therapist or a psychiatrist would tell you to do is when you get that feeling of you want to check something, 
you have to sit back and you have to resist as much as possible that temptation and those compulsive thoughts to do it. Now, the hardest part are the first 20 odd minutes or so because your anxiety levels will go through the roof because your mind is telling you, you've got to check it. Once you check it, everything will be fine. But obviously I know through 30 years of it that even when you check it several times, it sometimes isn't fine. So it's really weird for me to describe it to, to help you now because I still do it. So it's very, very difficult to kind to try and sort of preach to you and say, well, you've got to do this because I still find it very, very difficult. Um, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy may help you. They, they kind of, you kind of digress into your past and you, you kind of bring everything up. Um, didn't really obviously do much for me. Um, so what you need to do is try and get past that anxiety. They say that it's normally about 20 minutes of kind of extreme anxiety and then your feelings of wanting to check kind of subside. The difficulty is when those feelings become so powerful, you check something to prevent going through that anxiety. So it's kind of a six of one, half of the other. So either way, you can't really win. So it's very, very tough. That's kind of all of these sort of advice that I can offer you, unfortunately. I wish I could offer you more and I wish I could wave a wand and everything went away for anyone that's got OCD, whether it's, you know, OCD is a, is a, is a, it's a funny beast. It's like, um, you know, it's, it's, I can't, it's difficult to really explain. And when people say, oh, they're a little OCD, it kind of, it doesn't wind me up, but it's like, well, you're not OCD. You, you, to have OCD, you will know when you've got OCD. Do you know what I mean? Trust me, you'll know. Um, so, look, I'm sorry if that's kind of a little bit of a, a flouncy answer, but it's very, very difficult. I'm, I'm not, unfortunately, a, a counsellor or psychiatrist or like that, but um, that's what I can try and, you know, the, the advice that I can offer you. But seek, you know, definitely seek help. If you're not on medication and they prescribe medication, you know, think about it, see how you feel with it. Um, you know, only you can sort of decide that really. Um, uh, but look, I wish you all the best with it. If there's anything we can do to help or I can do to help personally, DM us. If you're going through a real struggling, you know, if you're going through a, you know, a real bad time and you feel like you really want to pick up a drink because of it, um, just DM me or DM us and I'll, I will speak to you or, but like I said, I'm not a counselor, but I'm, I can understand how you feel. And it, it can get very, very stressful at times. Um, but, you know, you'll be, hopefully you'll be fine. Um, you know, stay strong and try not to get tempted, you know, tempted into, into having a drink. Because ultimately, if you're anxious now, having a drink, trust me, will make you 10 times worse. Yeah. 10 times worse. Thank I think that'll probably really help. And just knowing that she's not on her own as well, I think. Absolutely. Well, and I think as well, there are, there, are, there are thousands of people or millions of people out there with OCD. I think, I think actually there was, a, there was a report saying, I'm not sure what the figures are exactly, but like what, it's like one in, it's either one in six or one in eight people have it or something. Wow. So it, it does take on different forms and different extremes, mm. but it can still be, you know, it can it can be debilitating at times, which can, oh, yeah. which can prove difficult. So you can take a lot from that in terms of quitting drinking though, because the way yeah. you talked about it was a bit like standing in the storm when the cravings come on. And it, it, that advice was awesome because that's, you know, I hear it all the time. How do I deal with these voices? It's like a lion roaring in my head. Standing in the storm is how you know you can get some power over it and knowing that absolutely. it actually passes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you do get, I mean, like, like I say, I, I still struggle with it, but but nowhere near as bad as I did, you know. Um, and like I said, a lot of it for me becomes like a habit. I, I do it without really knowing it sometimes. And that's kind of what I've done for most of my life. So it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of part of me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. And it, 
and in stressful situations it gets elevated and exaggerated as well doesn't it so the more stress you become the more you're doing it so i guess it's about mm -hmm. trying relaxation treatments as well with self-care you know trying to distract yourself when the compulsion comes by relaxing which is kind of really difficult but i guess that's going to help that's it i mean obviously one of the things about going to nepal was the meditation side of things i mean i i, I try to meditate but my mind is all over the place and you know that's kind of the whole point of meditation anyway is to if you get a thought coming in while you're meditating it, it's for it to, to come in and, and accept the that accept that you've got those thoughts and let them go that's the whole thing you, you need you know you accept that you've got the thoughts during meditation because it's going to happen you know you can't just sit there and do this and then all of a sudden you're like spaced out and you're in a zone for five minutes i wish it did happen like that for me but it doesn't <laughs> Thank so, you, Lee. I've been trying to teach that Alex for ages. <laughs> hey, I'm all right now. I'll have you know. I've done it for like nearly two weeks now without a break. I'm She's doing there. well. She's doing. I want to talk to you guys about Nepal. I really like. We'll do it another time, obviously. <laughs> Go, I mean, man. Next important. question. Then. <laughs> to, um, it's important. To, it's important to take that time on your own, though. That, that's the point. It's important to take that time on your own, whether you're meditating or not. To sit back, maybe light a joystick, light a candle, uh, listen to some relaxing music. Whatever it is that makes you feel relaxed, like with Sean, it's riding his bike, you know, his motorbike. So, like, you know, whatever it is, if you can, it's difficult at the moment. I know things are quite restrictive, but, um, you know, whatever it is you can do to help you, help yourself, then, then go for it. Amazing. Mandy, is there any more questions? There is one more, but uh, one thing I wanted to add about this is, like, you know, with any kind of mental health or any, any, have anything that you want to change or that you're dealing with, like the, the logical and the kind of emotional side. And um, uh, reading Brian e. Gordon's book, Mad Girl, was the kind of opening for me to be able to talk, to own my mental health and talk about it. And, you know, obviously her, her story is a lot about OCD. So I think, you know, if you, there's also Trigger Publishing, which is a publishing company specialised in mental health and wellbeing. And the guy that set that up, he uh, suffers from OCD. So I think that, you know, like, you know about it in a logical sense, but when you have the kind of inspiration and the, like, listening to Lee, you know, those two things together, they really help to kind of get a whole picture of like, okay, other people have got this, I'm not alone and they're talking my language and they understand as well as kind of the logical side of things so that's what i wanted to yeah um, now, there's, a, there's a strong link as well between ocd and like, addiction and things like that yeah. you know so you know there's loads and loads of stuff that you can read up on it and you know and there's loads of books out there that you know that explain it and you know it explains people's experiences with ocd and how they've got through it and how they've got over it so you know maybe check some of those out as well we'll pop some links on the facebook page for some yeah books. um yeah. so andrea says what would you tell your younger self now knowing what you know that you believe would have convinced you to stop drinking what well, about well, william because uh William, do you want to answer that one? Oh, sorry, Dave. William's getting younger every day anyway, so I'm not sure <laughs> what I mean. That one. He's Benjamin Button, isn't he? It's ridiculous. The sober Peter William. Pan. <laughs> the Cliff Richard of sobriety. You know, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I kind of think there's, there's probably nothing I could have said to stop myself drinking. I was... um. I don't know. I, th I think you have to make your own mistakes, don't you? And it's all very well someone saying to you X, Y, or Z may happen if you drink, but you kind of just think, I don't believe that, or you kind of just, the reality doesn't hit home, does it? You, you have to go through it. And I think one of the problems is a lot of, a lot of the problems with drinking are kind of, they're made comical, aren't they? Like we're almost encouraged to go out and get hammered. If you wake up yeah. the next day and you've done something stupid, <laughs> or you can't remember what you were doing, that's all kind of part of the fun of drinking. So I kind of think it's, it's almost impossible to think what you can tell yourself. I mean, for me, the big things was kind of getting the link between drinking and insomnia, um, and then understanding that a lot of the time it's actually causing um, anxiety rather than relieving it. You know, it's all, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If, if it gives you a level of comfort, then in half an hour, 
it's time, you get a level of anxiety and you need another drink to, to get on top of it. But genuinely, I think I was, <laughs> you know, I, I went the way I went and there was probably not much I could have said to myself to stop it, to be honest. Do you know what though, William? I wonder that if you'd never ever had a drink, how young you would actually look. <laughs> <Because it's ridiculous. laughs> It'd be I, a toddler. <laughs> I can't believe you're 73 years old. It's, 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 it's crazy. I, I think for me though, I, I think what I would tell myself is um, don't drink indoors because yeah. I was okay when I was actually out. I, I was like a typical lad. I was someone that went out on a Friday and Saturday and got pissed and whatever, but a bit like uh, I think Sean said that as soon as I started going to the office from the pub, I was already drunk and then I'd, I'd buy silly amounts of booze and that and stay up till two in the morning. And that's what I would tell myself now is just stay social, keep an eye on it, be sensible because then you can have a, a reasonably normal relationship with alcohol. But as soon as I started drinking, I was putting on weight and then I, I started to drink vodka. And then I was drinking a litre of vodka a night. And, and, you know, that's where it all... So that's what I would say, really. Simon, quickly, because I know, I know we've got... Um, we're well Sorry, Dave, time. I've got one more question here from someone on Facebook. Okay. If Simon can answer it. Go on, go for it. Right, OK. Top tips are ways to shake yourself out of a funk. That's F-U-N-K. <laughs> easier than others but especially right now with everything going on i found oh, myself a... sinking more into a terrible funk again same spelling uh, I, I, i'll tell you a good to thing myself. to do i was just sharing this book with someone it's called happiness by a lady called jill hassan it's so awesome and it looks at all your do you know the simplest way get to grips with what your values are in your life get some clarity on them there's an exercise you can do in that book to really unravel them and bring them out into the light and then make sure that your what you're doing in your life matches your values and that you're doing things that light you up you know like we talked about the motorbike the photography the things that light you up and bring you passion so if i had to guess you might not be doing those things right now so get and sometimes we do things that oppose them i used to do a sales job where we used to bend the truth my biggest value is honesty you know they it clashed with it no wonder i hated the job and started yeah. hating my life that's the quick answer. That was a good answer. <laughs> That's all I'm going to give because we've kind of run over by like ages. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That'll get you out of the funk. Well, anyway. I, I, I think guys can uh, ask questions as well afterwards and, and we do our best to answer in the comments, right? Is that correct? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So guys, uh, anyone watching now, if you want to ask some questions that we haven't answered, if there's anything about this that um, you want to talk to us about, we're all available. Um, I think we should wrap this up now. Lee and Sean, you've been absolutely amazing, boys. So proud of you both. So proud to know you. Guys on the panel, you again, you've been amazing too. Um, let's wrap this up. Thanks so much for viewing, guys. And Thanks, I think, guys. is that right? Um, this, this goes on Facebook and YouTube after? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll put all the links in the group. Again, yeah, thank you, guys. Honestly, Thanks, guys. you've given your thank time you to us so twice much, this all. week and we've loved it. Thank so, you so yeah. much. Let's hope it's recorded. Otherwise, oh, right. we'll be back on on Friday. <laughs> 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 See you later. Thanks, all right. Thanks Bye, everyone. Thank you.